so much everyone for joining today. Um, so this is a webinar uh, to introduce Fairwild to everyone, um, to explain a bit more about what Fairwild is about um, and how companies can get involved and, and others can get involved as well. Okay, so what are we going to cover in the webinar today? Um, well, first of all, we're gonna start with a bit of background about why, um, well, Fairwild exists, why wild plants are important um, and the need for um, looking at the sustainability of trade in wild plants. Um, then we'll explain a bit about what Fairwild is, what the Fairwild standard is, um, how Fairwild certification works, um, what ingredients are Fairwild certified, um, and then finally how businesses can use those ingredients um, in their products and also communicate the responsible sourcing that they, they're doing to their customers. And then, as I said, we'll have a section at the end. So first off, to introduce myself to anyone, anyone doesn't know, my, my name is Emily King um, and I'm the Business Engagement Officer for Fairwild. So my role is really to um, help explain um, what Fairwild means to businesses and um, help them guide them through the process of registering or certifying as a business. And we're going to start off by taking a look at why we as Fairwild care, care about wild plants. Um, so first off, sort of what is the situation of wild plants um, in trade? So there's um, thousands and thousands of species of, of plants, um, as, as we all know. Um, of those, about 26,000 have well-documented uses, um, both medicinally, but cosmetics, um, fragrances, food, and so on. And of that, a fraction, a smaller fraction, so 3,000, are in international trade. So the rest might be used more locally or regionally, but um, still a significant number are traded internationally across the world. However, what we don't really know much about is what the actual status is of those um, species that are in trade, um, what, the, what the scientific status is of them. Um, so only a, a, about a fifth have been assessed against extinction threat criteria. So we just don't have much information about the majority of these species. Um, what we do know is those that have been looked at about one in 10 of them are threatened with extinction in the wild. Um, so we know that of those that have been assessed, there is concern about a reasonable um, proportion of them. And we just don't have enough information about the rest to, to know what the status is. So it, it, it could be that they are doing fine or it could be that they are also um, at risk of extinction. Um, and that lack of information is, is also a cause for concern in itself. You know, the precautionary principle that um, is used sort of scientifically and in international policies really sets out that if not enough is known, we should take a, a precautionary approach when dealing with um, species. And in terms of what we know about the trade in species, so the species that are traded internationally, um, both the um, value and also the volume of trade is increasing. Um, so these figures and, and the ones in the previous slide are from a report that actually came out recently um, called the Wild Check Report. We'll, we'll send a link to that um, in the chat if anyone wants to know more. So it's got a lot of information about um, both trade and wild plant species at the general level, but also looks at 12 um, specific species in more detail as well and the risks um, and also opportunities in using those plants. So it's, it's worth checking that resource out for sure. Um, but what we've included here on the slide is showing that um, the value of trade uh, after being adjusted for inflation has increased 75% um, over the last couple of decades. And the volume of trade has not increased by quite the same percentage, but also increased markedly over that time. So this is an increasing trade as well. And especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, We've seen um, increase in demand for certain types of ingredients as well for COVID-19 remedies, for example. Um, and it is truly a global trade as well. So it's, um, as you can see from the list of top importers and exporters there, um, it really does cover all, diff all the different continents of the world. Um, and it's not sort of restricted to one region. So how do we characterise this global trade in terms of the people that are involved because it's obviously not just about the species it's also about the people that are using and also um, harvesting those ingredients and looking at the harvesting end of the trade chains the harvesters um, differ a lot by region in terms of the, the culture and history of that trade but there are a lot of commonalities as well 
So often um, the people that do the harvesting are um, in low income communities, um, might, based rurally, there's not many opportunities for um, generating income. So there's a lot of reliance on wild plant use, both for health in terms of traditional medicine, but also for um, income generation as well. And a lot of the trade is informal locally and, and also underreported. There's a lot of complex regulations for um, people doing collection to have to get to grips with as well, as well as it, with it international trade. Um, and a side effect of um, rural to urban migration is that there is, which is happening in um, sort of near enough university, is that there is a decline in both the number of people actually doing the collecting, but also traditional knowledge and practices and how to do this collection sustainably. So there's a lot of um, sort of human based um, areas of potential concern tied up with wild plant harvesting. But that said, there are also some great opportunities in terms of sustainable and harvesting and fair trade of wild plants. Um, so both in terms of um, um, ethical treatment of people and um, the habitats at the, the green end of supply chain and also for the end user markets. So there's growing awareness and interest in sustainability and fair trade across all sectors that might use wild plant ingredients, so cosmetics, um, food, herbal remedies and so on. Um, there's also increasing interest in the origins of products and the stories those can tell. There's also um, changing policy and legislative legislative framework. So, for example, um, in the EU, one um, forthcoming um, cha legislative change will be in the due diligence um, legislation that's coming out and the, the increasing requirements on businesses to be able to demonstrate they have understanding and knowledge of where the products they use, the ingredients they use and their products are coming from. And coupled with that, there's nice stories as well around the potential for landscape level conservation um, with using wild plant ingredients. So having set the scene with, with what the potential concerns are, I'm going to hand over to Bryony, who will explain a bit about what Fair Wild is and how it can help provide some of the solutions. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for joining our webinar today. It's great to see um, so many people on the call. So my name is Bryony. I also work for the Fair Wild Foundation. Um, I have quite a cross-cutting role managing aspects of the Fair Wild Standard and Certification Scheme day to day and also working on the development of the initiative. Okay, so I'll just explain a bit about what Fairwild does and the history of the initiative. So the mission of the foundation is to support the transformation of resource management and business practices towards sustainability. And we work throughout the supply chain for wild collected products. So Fairwild Foundation is actually a Swiss registered nonprofit initiative. It was established in 2008. Uh, it actually came out of a much longer standard setting process, um, which involved a number of different collaborating organizations who were developing standards and best practices in how to do sustainable harvesting and fair trade of the resources. We still work with many of those founding and collaborating organizations today. So you can see some of our partners listed at the bottom of the slide. We work quite closely with the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group, particularly on the um, pre-assessment of the species that are being proposed for uh, certification to look at their, their risk um, of sustainable um sorry the the risk of unsustainable harvesting that's associated with that species uh, wwf was one of our founding partners and we also collaborate on some practical projects and also with their um corporate engagement team profound is a consulting organization that works a lot on value chain um development approaches and also on the implementation of fair wild in certain certain projects and contexts. So Traffic is an NGO that is um, focused on the trade of wildlife resources more generally. Emily and I are both hosted in the Traffic office in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And we work quite closely with, with Traffic's network of offices around the world as well. And then finally, I'll also mention the Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network, which is another standard and certification initiative that's we have a, a collaboration with. 
So I'll explain a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. Okay. So the Fairwild standard is a sustainability standard with a third party audited certification scheme associated with it. It's focused on wild harvested plant ingredients and it combines both fair trade approaches with an emphasis on ecological sustainability. So particularly looking at how those wild resources are being managed and, and harvested from natural habitats. Okay, our work um, focuses on encouraging sustainable and fair business practices. We, through our labeling scheme and also our outreach, we influence consumer choice and provide options for consumers to identify and buy sustainably produced products. We have a program of work to advise and assist different partners and entities with projects in sustainable wild collection. And we can provide broader advice on the application of standards um, within the policy context as well. Okay. So the Fairwild standard itself is freely available on the Fairwild website. It encompasses what plants, fungi, and lichen. And as I mentioned, it combines fair trade with ecological aspects of sustainability. So it's quite unique in the uh, family of standards and certifications out there that it really focuses on wild collection. That's our area of specialism. It's universally applicable. So actually you can apply the fair wild standard in any country. We're not restricted to more traditional sort of developing country context. And it can be applied in different scenarios. So both species that are at high risk of over harvesting, but also those that perhaps have other risks associated with them, such as social or the economic context. So the Fairwild Standard has 11 different principles. 10 of those are applicable to the wild harvesting operation. So the organization that's actually harvesting the resources in the field at ground level. Uh, those are organized into four sections those focused on wild collection and conservation. We both look at the target species that's being harvested. Is that being done in a sustainable manner? But we also look at the broader landscape in which the harvesting has taken place. Are there any negative environmental impacts of that harvesting, perhaps on other species or sensitive habitats that are found in the collection site? Fairwild also looks at the social and fair trade aspects of sustainable harvesting. And it really focuses on the relationship between the wild harvesting operation and the collectors who are doing the harvesting. Quite often, those people are not employees of the wild harvesting operation. They might be farming communities, perhaps people who are doing this work seasonally to get some additional income. So they usually wouldn't have employment contracts. So they are in quite a precarious um, situation with regards to any kind of rights. So we look at that relationship between the wild harvesting operation and the people that are supplying it. Is it fair? You know, are they getting the right information? Are they being paid sufficiently? Fairwild also looks at issues around the participation of children in wild collection. It doesn't completely exclude the participation of children because it can be an important cultural um, activity. Children may accompany parents, for example, to the field to collect, but they should not be part of the, the workforce. They shouldn't be employed as, as collectors. So there's a very clear distinction drawn there that some participation of children may be possible, but it has to be very carefully scrutinized and they should not be part of the, the actual workforce during the collection. And any work that they do should be age appropriate and not interfere with education. Uh, Fairwild looks at the benefits to collectors in their communities from wild harvesting. So both in terms of the payment that they receive for supplying wild harvested ingredients. So if they're harvesting resources by the kilo, is the amount that they're paid sufficient to cover the work that's involved in doing that harvesting? And we also have a uh, premium fund approach. So an additional payment uh, it's made on top of the 
the payment that collectors receive individually into a premium fund that can be used to invest into, into their communities. On the legal and ethical side, Fairwild looks at aspects such as laws affecting the wild collection, so including any harvesting in and around protected areas, are those protected area laws being um, respected and complied with, as well as all other aspects of the, the legal regulation of, of wild harvesting. Uh, Fairwild also looks into issues around customary rights to use the resource and also benefit sharing. So compliance with the Nagoya protocol, for example, on access and benefit sharing under the, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And then finally, Fairwild also goes into the management and business practices associated with the wild harvesting. So is there a management system in place to ensure that the wild harvesting is done sustainably? Are the collectors regularly trained? Are they properly supervised in, in doing the harvesting? And then on the business side, are all of the systems in place that are needed to manage the wild, wild harvesting, both sustainably, but also to meet quality standards? So is there traceability in place, for example? And then finally, there's one principle um, as well that is applicable to buyers of wild collected products. So we expect all of the companies that participate in the Fair Wild certification system to commit to um, sourcing ingredients sustainably and also paying sufficient prices to enable all of these good places to actually take place on the ground. That's a very important principle that companies sourcing from Fair Wild certified operations will also sign up to. So Fairwild is a voluntary standard and certification scheme, but it fits into an, an important international context. Fairwild is actually recognized as an appropriate to tool to support delivery of the CBD's global strategy on plant conservation. So you can find Fairwild referenced in the toolkit that's been developed to support implementation of the CBD. Fairwild is also quite a suitable standard to support implementation of other laws on um, the trade, the international trade in wild plants. So because of its species focused approach, it's quite in line also with the principles around CITES and the implementation of CITES. And there's been some work exploring how voluntary standards such as Fair Wild can actually support the implementation of, of those types of agreements. And then finally, Fairwild is also a very suitable tool to support industry action on sustainable sourcing in the context of the sustainable development goals. So the standard is very much aligned with those goals. You can see some of the um, most related goals listed at the bottom, but it very much um, supports delivery on targets such as gender equality, responsible consumption and production. So it's a very practical tool to help achieve collective action towards those goals. So Fairwild, as I mentioned earlier, it's specialized on wild harvesting and it's really, we would consider it to be the most comprehensive and rigorous certification for wild plants specifically. We do have a difference in approach for high risk plants versus low risk plants. So I think we'll come back to that later in the presentation. Um, it's quite complementary to other certifications. So quite often Fairwild is implemented together with organic certification. And it's also aligned with fair trade principles. So we're quite open to strategic recognitions and collaborations around this as well. Fairwild is already recognized under the Fair, Wild, Fair for Life program. So Fair for Life labeled products using Fairwild ingredients um, can, can also be labeled with the Fair for Life uh, label. And as I mentioned before, we also have a collaboration with the Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network. So this is a standard and certification that is focused on contribution towards uh, conservation of keystone species in particular landscapes and areas. So if uh, there are sourcing operations there 
that would be interested to explore a co-certification approach between Fairwild and the wildlife friendly label, that's something we'd be very interested to pick up as well. Okay, so Fairwild um, is now quite a network. We now have more than 50 different companies participating in different parts of the certification scheme. We have 26 different species that are currently certified from 17 different countries in total. And there are more than 60 different products on the market and now quite widely retailed in different markets around the world. Okay, so this slide just shows some of those operations that are now involved in Fairwild. So on the map, you can see the markers of the different certified operations. So those are actually the, the suppliers of wild harvested ingredients with the Fairwild certification. So really expanding over quite different range of, of countries in, around the world. Uh, in the bottom left part of the screen, you can also see some of the trading companies that we work with. So these are in our companies that will uh, source from this network of um, well, certified wild collection operations and supply ingredients to the global market. And in the top right, you can see some of the different brands that we're working with that are already using the Fairwild ingredients in different label products. And these are quite a range of different companies from cosmetics, food, beverage, and herbal tea ingredients, for example. Okay, and then this is a list of the different certified ingredients that are already commercially available with, with Fairwild certification. So again, quite a range of different species, including ingredients such as baobab, which is both um, the baobab powder and also baobab oil, through to ingredients that are used in traditional herbal products, including herbal teas and, and wellness products. And then also some resins such as frankincense and myrrh. So you can find all of these on the Fairwild website and explore which ingredients are available from which suppliers. Okay, and this is just an example of one of the projects on the ground. So you can see the type of, of impact that Fairwild certification is, ha is having. Uh, Nature Connect is a certified operation in India's Western Ghats, which is one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. And their work on sustainable sourcing of, of two species used in Ayurvedic medicine and dietary supplements are providing sustainable livelihood opportunities to over 100 operate uh, over 100 collectors, and they're also helping to protect um, over 1,300 trees, which are the the source of these fruits that are being used in the products, which are also nesting sites for the great hornbill and the malapai pied hornbill. So it's also a lovely connection to. Um, important keystone species that you can find in those sites that are benefiting from Fairwild certification. Okay, so I think at this point I might be handing back over to Emily, so thanks very much. Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, so after that introduction as to what Fairwild is and, and what is available as Fairwild certified, I'm going to take a moment to explain how businesses can actually then get involved and use some of these ingredients in their supply chain. So just to, to take a step back and explain um, how different types of businesses relate to Fairwild. Um, we've talked a bit about the standard and the certification and Brian explained how the standard mainly applies to the wild collection operation. So, so the business is actually um, doing the collection of the ingredients from, from the wild. So those businesses are the ones which are audited and certified against the standard. They would liaise with a certification body Now, I'll, I'll touch on in a, just a moment um, to arrange that audit and then hopefully achieve the certification and be issued with a certificate for the species they were audited for. Businesses further up the supply chain um, instead work more directly with the Fairwild Foundation um, to sort out registering as a business. Um, so at the far end of the trade chain, we have um, businesses which are brands or micro enterprises. So the ones actually making products that would be sold to consumers. 
then in the middle, we have all the all of the other types of businesses that we um, group into a, a category called processors and traders. So those are businesses maybe doing um, uh, cutting of um, roots down into different cuts for tea bags, maybe creating extracts, uh, maybe doing importing or exporting. There's quite a variety of different types of business activity that might be covered under that registration category. Um, and the reason that we have those two different categories um, for businesses to register as is just reflecting the use of uh, the Fair Wild label on products for consumers. So there's slightly different requirements for the two different types of business. But one business, if they carry out both types of activities, so both B2B and also B2C sales, they can register as both types. So for certification, as I mentioned, that's um, because we are a third party um, type of certification, um, the audits, most of the arrangement that um, auditing and issuing of certificates is actually carried out by control bodies. So at the moment, there are four different control bodies which are accredited to carry out Fair Wild um, audits and issue certificates. They're listed at the bottom of the slide there, but also on our website. And they can carry out audits um, that there's, there's global spread of where audits can be carried out. Um, so the pr process would be to um, get in touch with one of these, one, one or more of these control bodies to express an interest in arranging an audit. Um, have a quote issued and also discuss any questions in terms of timing and cost with the control bodies. Um, it is an on-site audit um, that happens each year, even though for the last few years we have had an amended procedure because of the difficulty of actually carrying out on-site audits. Um, but the, the, the standard procedure is that it would be an on-site audit every year. Um, and the audit looks at compliance with the, the, the contents of the Fair Wild standard that Bryony outlined there. Um, there are some detailed um, performance indicators that are used during an audit, uh, and those are also available on the Fair Wild website. So you can actually see in detail what would be looked at during the course of the, the audit being carried out. Then there is a distinction between low, medium and high risk species that Bryony touched on earlier. So this is an initial step of carrying out a risk assessment. So this is the bit where Fair Wild Foundation would be directly involved in, in uh, preparing for the audit. So that is a desk-based piece of research. There is a very small fee associated with that. Um, and the details for that on our website, or we, we can share them by email afterwards. Um, and that is a piece of um, research that's done by consultants at the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group. Um, that looks at the information that's known about the species and the country that the species is going to be harvested from and assigns a score um, based on the, the information that's available. If a species comes out as high risk, so for example, if it was um, considered to be um, endangered globally or there were some other um, factors at play that might be assigning it a high risk score, that doesn't necessarily mean that certification cannot happen. What it does mean is that there's additional requirements that are placed on the operation that is going to have the audit. Um, so, for example, even um, greater threshold for, for what is required in terms of a, a management plan and, and monitoring and so on. At the other end of the, the supply chain, so for the brands or businesses making products for consumers, they can register to use the Fair Wild label on products and in marketing materials. Um, so if a company wants to make any communications about the Fair Wild status of ingredients, then they, they require to register with us. And these are some examples of products that are available on the market at the moment that have the Fair Wild um, label on, on the products. We also have, um, as of last year, a, a new option for businesses that do um, sell products to consumers, um, which is for micro enterprises. So essentially it's the same um, type of registration as for brands. Um, it's just tailored for the situation that startups or um, herbalists, for example, um, might find themselves in. So it's tailored for small um, businesses or sole traders. So there's a, there's a turnover um, threshold in terms of the turnover has to be less than 75,000 euros per year and a limited sphere of distribution. Um, but with that, there's a discounted registration fee and also a reduced burden in terms of, of um, turnover fees that might be due each year. 
so in terms of actually finding the ingredients then to to include in products if that that's of interest obviously one option is working with your current suppliers to um achieve certification or work towards certification um but for some businesses that doesn't um really fit with their current um supply system um for example they might be purchasing or having their products made through a trader or a contract manufacturer what might work better for them or as an intermediary step um, would be to switch to a supplier that is already certified for ingredients so you can find the full list on our website and we've, we've put the link in the chat there um, and we're very proactive in the foundation or to, to try and help make those connections between um, businesses that are certified and have ingredients available um, and brands that are interested in using those ingredients. So if you have any questions, um, if you see any, if you're interested in ingredients not listed on the website, do still get in touch with us um, and we can help to see if there's any businesses that might be working towards certification, but um, uh, have maybe not actually had their first audit yet, for example, uh, and try and make those connections. So, for example, we do um, profile on our website ingredients that are not certified at the moment, but are hopefully coming soon. So there are some examples here. Um, you can see the full list by clicking on the link in the chat. Um, and these are what we call potential ingredients. So, um, for example, gum Arabic, which is used in a, a large variety of applications. So um, soft drinks, um, coatings for tablets and so on. Um, see buckthorn, which is um, becoming a more popular cosmetic ingredient, um, St. John's wort, you know, traditional herbal remedy. Um, and all of these are ingredients which either could be added to the certificate of a currently certified company. So um, they, they may, for example, be a company that has just started with a smaller section of the ingredients that they harvest from the wild and they're just seeking market interest to add more. Or it might be a company that is working towards certification. Um, so, for example, they might have had the risk analysis done, but they've just not actually had the audit yet. It might be scheduled for later in the year, for example. And again, they're looking for market interest to um, really feel secure in moving forward with having the audit and bringing those products to market. And the details of those are on our website as well. But if you would, again, like to learn more, then we are available via email. And Something else that we're excited about at the moment in terms of products that are um, hopefully going to be available as Fairwell certified in the coming um, year or so um, is fungi. So at the moment we're um, piloting this or working towards piloting this as an application of the standard. Um, as Brian mentioned at the beginning, Fairwild standard is applicable um, to plants, fungi and lichen. But just due to the different um, life characteristics of fungi versus plants, there's needed to be some slight adaptation of the requirements in, in the performance indicator. So how an audit is actually assessed um, as well as the risk analysis to adapt it for, for fungi. Um, so that process is happening at the moment and we're looking to carry out pilot projects on application of this, this um, adjusted performance indicators and risk analysis um, with the hope that in the next, um, within the next year, the first audits would be able to be carried out. So again, if that's something you'd like to know more about, then do get in touch. So in terms of the actual steps to take, if you would like to um, get involved with Fairwild, they are slightly different um, for if you're a company that's looking to have an audit carried out, so be certified, versus if you're a company that would be looking to register with Fairwild, so use ingredients. It might be that the certification process is applicable for you as well if you'd be working with your supplier. Um, so the first step is to just determine the eligibility. So that's are you using or, or sourcing wild plant ingredients? And then to determine uh, the readiness for the audit. Um, so that means just having a think about um, are there any gaps that you have identified yourselves in terms of maybe um, you need to uh, put a management plan in place or just refresh a management plan if, if you already have one. Um, these two steps are not requirements, they're just our recommendations to um, make sure that you feel that you are ready to proceed towards an audit. Um, and again, we can offer more guidance on, on those two steps as well. The first formal step is to carry out a risk assessment. So that's the desk based piece of research I mentioned earlier. Um, and there is a form available on our website to um, begin that process formally. But you can also just get in touch via email and say that this is what you're, you're interested in doing and what you're thinking about um, starting and we can provide guidance um, tailored to you. 
um, it's put as the next step, but really it's, it's more simultaneous um, with the risk assessment is to contact one of the one or more of the accredited control bodies. As I said, they are able to issue a quote and, and guidance on what it would look like to, um, to have an audit carried out. So costs, timings, um, the procedures that would happen and so on. So they're really the best source of information in terms of actually planning an audit or, or if you have any questions on what the audit procedure would look like. Then if we skip forward a bit in, in time, because there can be a bit of work between in that initial um, conversation with the control bodies and, and the audit happening, um, they'll have their own forms, but they'll guide you through that process. Um, and then the audit will, will be carried out. So that would usually happen during the harvest season of the species that are, are to be certified. Um, and that would require a visit from an auditor. They would carry out the audit over um, a period of days. Um, usually have interviews with collectors, with the workers in um, a processing facility, um, and so on. They would then produce a report, and that report was reviewed by the control body, and then a certification issue uh, decision would be issued. So usually that just results in certification. It might be that there's some feedback that needs to be addressed before the certificate can be issued, or it might be there's some more detailed guidance issued which would need to be addressed before an audit was carried out again next year. But hopefully it results in certification um, and then the company can begin trading Fairwild certified ingredients. So that leads us on to then what the steps are for the businesses that wish to use those ingredients. So these are the traders and also brands that I mentioned in, in the flowchart diagram earlier. So these are companies that are not directly audited against the standard. Instead, they register with the Fairwild Foundation. So the process is slightly different. So the first step really is to either be already sourcing the ingredients or have lined up to begin using Fairwild certified ingredients in products or to, to be trading them. Then we recommend reviewing the rules that are applicable to these types of business, to registered businesses. So there's two sets of rules which are available on the Fairwild website, which are relevant. The first one is a set of trading rules. So that's really setting out what is expected in terms of um, traceability of the ingredients, um, document keeping, um, reporting to the Fair Wild Foundation and so on. We also then have a set of labeling rules. So this is more um, focused on, um, for, for brands mainly, in terms of what they can put on their product to communicate consumers that they are using fair wild ingredients in that product um, but it also looks at um, communications in other forms so for example on websites in um, marketing in um, social media and so on um, and there's also some guidance in there for companies that do b2b sales so registered as traders in terms of what is required to put on um, labels for transport documents and so on uh, like transport packages so once reviewing those two documents um, it'd be best to get in touch with us if you have any questions and, and also when you're being to think about registering as a, as a fair wild business, just so we can guide you through the process. Um, there is then a form that needs to be filled in and returned to the Fair Wild Foundation. It's a relatively straightforward form um, asking for information on, you know, what type of business it is, what, what fair wild ingredients you'd be um, using, whether which certified company or, or registered company they're purchased from and so on. Um, and also some statements on um, how you will ensure you're complying with the trading rules. Then for brand companies, so those that are wanting to put the Fairwild la label on finished products, there's also a license agreement that needs to be signed. And then fees for registering. So these are set out on our website as well, but it's a set annual fee. So for brands, 500 euros, for traders, 200 euros. And there's also a variable fee, which just depends on the volume of trade of, of Fair Wild products in, in the previous calendar year. So it's only due in the first year after registering. So for any registrations now, that variable fee would first be due in um, by the end of March 2023, so next year. And the fee structure for that is set out in the document on our website as well. Once that's been done, or whilst the registration form is being finalised, um, licensees, so, so branded companies, um, can also get approval for the design of the packet, the 
product that is going to have the Fairwild label on it. So that needs to be sent to the Fairwild Foundation. We just check it aligns with what's out in the labeling rules, and then we issue approval for that. Um, and then product is labeled and it's ready to, ready to go. So in terms of options, this is set out in a lot more detail in the labeling rules, just to explain at a high level. Um, there's two different options for labeling finished products, um, depending on the volume of the Fairwild ingredient in the product. Um, so the first one is allowing for labeling on front of pack, so in a prominent position, and also the option of referring to Fairwild in the name of the product. So for example, Fairwild herbal tincture or uh, Fairwild elderberry cordial or, or something like that. Um, there are different thresholds depending on whether it's a consumable product, so a food or a drink or a, a supplement, for example, or whether it's a cosmetic product. Um, so there are slightly higher thresholds for the minimum amount of Fairwild certified ingredient in the end product for a consumable, which is 20% Fairwild certified ingredient, um, and it's 10% for cosmetics. But there's also requirements for the other ingredients as well in terms of the, the other certifications that those ingredients might hold. The second option, and there's a different, um, well, there's, there's no threshold in terms of the minimum amount of percentage of Fairwell ingredients, is labeling can happen on the back of pack. Um, there has to be an indication in the ingredients list which the Fairwell certified ingredient or ingredients are. And there has to be a uh, amount stated after the ingredients list. So for example, if a product was 10% um, Fairwell certified licorice, that would need to be indicated at the ingredients list and then that percentage stated afterwards as well. Um, and what that means is the Fairwell label can be used on, on back of pack, as I said, um, in line with other um, certification or, or standard labels that you might have on there. So for example, organic. Um, if a product meets the threshold for the first type of labeling, so it is actually quite a high percentage of Fairwell ingredients in there. You can still just use the label on back of pack if that it fits more with, with branding that you have as a, as a um, for your packaging. Um, for both, there is both types of labeling options. There's also um, an additional requirement in terms of the other types and the other ingredients in there, um, in terms of if there are other ingredients that are considered to be threatened that are wild sourced in there, they can only be included if it's Fairwild certified. But if there's any questions on that or any of the, the labeling rules in more detail, then you can always reach out to us via email and set up a one-to-one -one call. So the, the last thing I wanted to touch on before we, we see if there are any questions um, is just to say that we also have an annual um, online social media event called Fairwild Week. Um, and this is to generate interest and awareness amongst consumers, but also industry more generally as well as to um, the role of wild plants in everyone's lives and also the potential for fair wild certified ingredients to really celebrate the use of wild plant ingredients and also the, the people and plants involved in the harvesting. Uh, so that's actually coming up quite soon now. It's about, it's about a month away. Um, so 20th to 24th of June this year. Um, so there's more detail on our website as to how you can get involved with that. But essentially, it's just getting on online in your social media channels, um, sharing content around um, wild plants and trying to get that conversation um, r really going with your consumers um, and with your customers around um, use of wild plant ingredients. So do get involved in that. So, so just to, to finish, a couple of um, sort of actions to take away um, is, yeah, just have to start this as a conversation with your colleagues or your customers about fair wild involvement. You know, what does it mean for you? What could it mean for you? Um, get in touch with us. So the email address Brian just popped in the chat there um, to see if you have any questions or if you'd like to discuss any elements of what we've covered further. Appreciate it, it was quite a, a whistle stop tour. So some of the, the finer points of the actual practicalities of getting involved might, might need further explanation for your specific situation. So we're happy to, to arrange a call or, or follow up further via email. Um, and a lot of the things we've covered are available. Everything we've covered is available on our website as well. So there's, um, guidance documents there, there's the forms you'd need, there's the regulations, there's the um, standard, the performance indicators, um, everything is on there as well as recordings of previous webinars we've done and some information on Fair Wild Week as well. So do check that out. And just finally to leave it with um, 
the words of some the head of American Botanical Council who um, said this quote a, a few years ago and we, we really liked it. So farewell certification is not a fad, it is a trend. So it's a growing in terms of um, numbers of businesses participating, species certified, volumes traded, countries um, ingredients are sourced from. Um, so now is the time to really get on board with it as a, as a concept and also get your company involved as well. Um, and very finally, I'd just like to thank all the businesses that um, donate to help support our work. So as well as being involved um, directly, businesses can also support um, by a, a donation, one-off or recurring. Um, and we really do appreciate that to help um, fund outreach events such as this webinar. So thank you very much to them. And I'd like to thank everyone here for attending today as well. It's been great to hear um, so many people, see so many people joining and hear the questions that you've got. Um, and we look forward to being in touch with you further. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>